the uh, newspaper in Roswell, New Mexico on 1947 had an interesting headline. It said that the United States had captured a crashed flying saucer. Interesting history to this as you look back into it. The United States announced that they had recovered some flying disks. The newspapers reported this. Flying saucers captured Roswell, New Mexico. The next day, the U.S. Uh, issued a correction. They had not uh, captured or recovered a flying saucer at all. In fact, all they had recovered was a crashed weather balloon. Anybody who had been at the site or had seen photos of the site, there had been a lot of people like this, knew the U.S. government was lying. 1995, the U.S. government officially announced that, in fact, in 1947, they lied. They lied on purpose. They lied because they did not want the people of the United States or the people of the world to know one of their most highly classified military secrets. So today I will tell you what really happened in Roswell, New Mexico in 1947 about the military secret. It is no longer classified, but it's a little bit different than many people thought. So we'll talk about what happened there. As a prelude to that, because a key character in the 1947 events was a physicist named Maurice Ewing, who you may not have heard about. Maurice Ewing. At the beginning of World War II, he was studying the oceans. And he came up with a rather, a rather amazing discovery, which was one of the most classified aspects of World War II. And based on that discovery, he came up with an extremely clever invention. And let me tell you about this invention, just, just to present it as a mystery. Imagine, ima imagine how useful this is and how difficult it is to figure out how it works. Imagine you're the enemy, for example, and you, you capture an American pilot, an American pilot who was shot down over the Pacific. In his emergency kit, he had these spheres. They were called SOFAR spheres. S-O-F-A-R, so far spheres. And his instructions were, if he gets shot down over the Pacific, to drop one overboard. And then wait. If nothing happens, if eight hours later nobody has picked you up, you drop another. Now this is the Pacific Ocean. And let's say you're on a mission where you got thrown off by a storm, or maybe someone was chasing you, and you're hundreds of miles from where anybody expected you to be, and you get shot down, and here you are in the ocean, and your instructions are, open up your emergency kit, there's some extra water in there, a little bit of food. Don't send a radio signal, because if you send a radio signal, the enemy might pick it up and know where you are and go and capture you. Instead, drop this sphere overboard. And if you do that, a few hours later, the planes will come and pick you up. This was the invention of Maurice Ewing, the so far spheres. And they're related directly to the events of Roswell, New Mexico in 1947, because that was also a project of Maurice Ewing. It was a project that he invented based on his success with the oceans. And in both cases, it has to do with the movement of waves. Um, let me just give you the so far story right away. These spheres, if you found them, if you were the enemy and you learned this, and here's this guy and he said he's supposed to drop these overboard, and, and you have one, and say, well, let's, let's see how it works. So you cut it open and it turns out it's a hollow metal sphere with nothing inside, just big empty space. That's it. How could that work? What Maurice Ewing had discovered was deep down in the ocean, there was a phenomenon that we now call the sound channel. We're going to be talking a lot about the sound channel and how sound moves. And the essence of the sound channel 
for the whole flying saucer story. Deep down under the ocean, you have molecules. Suppose you make a sound in the ocean. Now, uh, Ewing may have had a clever idea for making a sound in the ocean. It was you take a metal sphere and you make it hollow. This metal, hollow metal sphere will, will take a lot of pressure. You make the metal sphere, even though it's hollow, if you make it out of the right metal, you'll make it heavier than an equal amount of water. If it's lighter than an equal amount of water, it will float. That's why wood floats. If it's heavier than an equal amount of water, it will sink and keep on sinking. So his idea was give the down pilot a metal sphere, a hollow metal sphere, more dense than water. He'll throw it overboard. This thing will sink into the ocean, and it'll sink and sink and sink and keep on sinking. Now, as it gets under the water, you have the weight of the water above it. As it gets deeper, the pressure increases. You get deeper and deeper and deeper, and the pressure gets greater and greater. And finally, you get to the pressure that's greater than the palm of your hands. You get down. He designed it so it would break at a depth of about one kilometer, a thousand meters. When it gets down there, it starts to break, and at that point, it's like an egg. Once you bent it and it's beginning to break, the thing goes catastrophically, and the enormous pressure brings it in. And in fact, what, hap what happens when it comes in like that is, bang, it makes a wave. So Maurice Ewing had invented a way for a pilot to take an egg, called a sofar sphere, drop it overboard, it would fall down, drop down, it would sink to about a kilometer, and when it got to the to a depth of a kilometer, the pressure was such that it would catastrophically collapse and it would make a loud noise. Basically, the water on both sides of this thing banging suddenly against each other would make a pop just like the clapping of my hands. A very loud pop because of the enormous pressure in this thing. So you'd make sound underwater. Now, water is like air. Uh, you move a molecule and you bounce it, and it will move the molecule next to it. And that'll move the molecule next to that, and so on and so on and so on. So you get a sound wave going. Here's how it works. You get down to one kilometer, and you make this sound. And yeah, some of the sound goes up, and that actually does go up. Some of the sound goes straight down, that actually goes to the Some of it goes horizontally, and that goes great distances. But the sound that goes at an angle is bent. The sound doesn't go in a straight line. What happens is it's bent like this, and then it's bent back up, and it's bent like this, and so on. And so the sound that goes at this angle is also bent. And the sound that goes at this angle is also bent. And so on. The sound that goes at this angle is also bent. And the result is a little of the sound that goes like this is, escapes. But some of the sound, about half the sound, gets trapped into this virtual surface. And because it's trapped, it doesn't spread out as much. And because it doesn't spread out as much, it can go really long distances and still be heard. There are two things that make these things bend. One is the fact that as you're coming down, the water's getting colder. And the other is, as you're coming down, there's more pressure. And these work together to make up here a wave traveling horizontally is fast. Down here, a wave traveling horizontally is slow. And down here, a wave tra traveling horizontally is fast. Up here it was fast, but this was what, was, what, what became called the sound channel. And it was a, at a depth of about a kilometer. And it was a region where waves move slowly. Now look what happens. A wave, suppose the wave starts moving upward, like this. Here's a wave that's moving upward. The bottom part is moving slower, so the wave tends to turn and come on down. Now it's going this way. And now the bottom part's getting into the fast region, and the upper part's in the slow region. So this part slows down, and the wave goes like that. And so the wave tends to get trapped in the sound channel. And because of that, it doesn't spread out very much, and because it doesn't spread out, it can be heard for long distances, which is what the whales discovered, and then one day Maurice Ewing discovered. Okay, so here you are, you have a microphone, and you hear ping, 
say, whoops, we have a soldier, we have a, a, a pilot down in the water, he just released a SOFAR sphere. What do you do with that ping? What you need is more than one ping. Suppose the pilot is right here, and you have 1,000 miles away, you have a microphone here, another one here, another one here. This one you'll hear it first, because that's the closest. Then you get this one and this one. If you know the distance to three of these microphones, you can tell where it is. What you do is you look at it and hear when the sound comes in. If the microphones were all equidistant, the sound would all come in at the same time, you know it's in the center of the circle. Not hard math. If they're not equidistant, you just listen to when they come in, and you can find the unique location where the sound would have reached those microphones in that order with that spacing. And that's what he did. You put down these microphones at various places. He had them on the Hawaiian Islands. And if you hear this ping, you know where the pilot is, you send an airplane there. But the marvelous thing is, the, if you found one of these spheres, you wouldn't think it was a secret anything. Because it only works because of the sound channel. End of World War II, Maurice Ewing, thinking about the atmosphere. And he realizes there's a sound channel in the atmosphere. How does he realize that? I felt really stupid in 1995 when I read all of this. The reason is, I knew all the physics. Why did I never realize there would be a sound channel in the atmosphere? So, let's take a look at the atmosphere. Here we are in the ground. And sometimes it's pretty warm down here. But as you get up higher, it gets cool. Just because expanding air, if the wind happens to blow some air up, the air expands. When the air expands, it gets cool. So you get cool air up here. But if you get high enough, you get to the ozone layer, and then it gets warm again. Warm because of the ozone. The ozone absorbs the ultraviolet radiation from the sun, protects us from the ultraviolet radiation of the sun, but makes this warm area that's called the stratosphere. Here's the wave traveling. The bottom is slowed down, because this is getting into the fast part. And so it bends. And, and, and the wave, you'll, you'll trap sound in the sound channel. And so it doesn't spread out. So if you want to actually make a sound that's heard around the world, the best place to go is up in the sound channel. Now, if birds were as big as whales, maybe they would do this. They'd go up to the sound channel and go, chip, 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 and the sound would go around the world. We know of no animals that make use of the sound channel, except for Maurice Ewing. His idea was the following. 19, basically 1945, the US has exploded a nuclear bomb. A nuclear bomb is a very, you know, you get this explosion, then you have this very hot amount of air, very, very hot. Because it's very hot, it starts to rise. That's what we call the mushroom cloud. But some hearts are hotter than others, so this thing is very turbulent. A nuclear bomb first had the blast, then you have this really turbulent hot air that makes a roar. So the initial sound may be very loud, but then you have this roaring sound because of the hot, turbulent air that's rising. When this hot air gets up to the sound channel, it's making a lot of sound. When it gets to the sound channel, that sound will not spread out as much. It will basically travel around the sound channel for thousands of miles. So of what use is this? It's not loud enough to do any damage. Well. Back in 1945, the United States was seriously worried about the Soviet Union. We knew that they were building a nuclear bomb, too. How could we tell when they succeeded? Ewing's idea was, let's go up to the sound channel and listen. See, back then, we didn't have spy satellites. We didn't even have spies. Stalin was very good. If he had anybody who was indirectly, mildly suspected in some way of not being completely loyal, he simply killed them. Very hard to be a spy under Stalin, because he had such a low threshold. We're slaughtering you. So we didn't have any spies there. We couldn't know what was going on. If you just sort of looked funny, he would kill you. 
I mean, he killed 30 million people. 30 million people killed by Stalin. So, no spies, how do you find out? You listen. If he makes a nuclear bomb, by the time it gets up to the sound channel, just above, just above the, the, just below the stratosphere, the sound will travel around the world. So this was uh, Ewing's idea. Let's put some microphones in the sound channel. Now this was a highly classified program. It was about as classified as anything got back in 1945 because it was relating to nuclear weapons. And we didn't want the Russians to know that we could listen in to their nuclear weapons tests. We could tell where they were by how the sound arrived from different directions. So we would know the location where they were testing them, just like we knew the location of the pilot from his so far spheres. You put these microphones up at various places around the world. So we can get all sorts of information. We didn't want them knowing about this. So it was highly classified. It was classified along with nuclear weapons. Now, to put a microphone up here, we're talking about, about putting microphones up at the top of the thunderheads and keeping them up there for long periods of time. Moreover, they have to listen, so you want it to be a quiet environment. So we had this idea that you would put it up with balloons. It's a natural way to do it. You require very big balloons to be able to keep the microphones up there that long. The project was called Project Mogul. And I knew Spillhouse for years. Project Mogul, very highly classified. He never told me about it. Uh, in fact, it got shut down after five or six years because it turned out there was a better way to detect nuclear explosions. Earthquakes. When you explode a nuclear bomb, it makes the Earth shake. That sends a wave through the Earth. Now, a key thing about earthquakes is most of them, they take place underground. The ones we had here last week were five, eight miles deep. But a nuclear explosion is on the surface. So you can detect that. It's also a little bit different from an earthquake. So these make the Earth shake. The shaking travels. You can detect it on the other side of the Earth. This eventually put Project Mogul out of business because it was so much easier to detect these little earthquakes. Coming. And you could tell where the, where, the, where the bombs were from the earthquakes, too, by looking at the waves coming to different locations around the world. Looking at the time when they arrived, you could tell precisely where the nuclear weapons were being tested. In 1945, Project Mogul was to take these microphones. Now, the, micro, the best microphones they had, you'll see this in old movies. You watch the movie Aviator, and you'll see the movies they had. Microphones then were high-tech, and they were difficult. And the problem was, when you have a microphone, you put it on a stand, and little vibrations of the ground in the stand would be picked up by the microphone. It was called microphonics. If you have a microphone that's attached to something, it's sitting on the table, it picks up these microphonics, and you're getting all these vibrations and squeals and noises and so on. So what they had to do is suspend the microphone. What they would do is they would take the microphone and have a delicate wire coming out of it to carry the signal, and they suspend this on springs. And you'll see this in the old movies. And they'll put the spring on a disc like this, and then this is the disc microphone. So this kind of disc microphone was the high tech of 1945. And with what everybody used, you look at old pictures, you'll see these old disc microphones. Now we have much better ways of doing it. But, but so, the suspension so on the springs like Ewing flew these disc microphones from my friend Athelstan Spillhouse's balloon up into this area where the sound layer was. And he would fly these balloons. How, where do you fly them from? Well, you know, this is all highly classified. What is being done with these balloons? Uh, well, we're detecting nuclear explosions. It's all classified. We don't talk about that. There was only one location in the United States where you could do the following two things. One was a place where you could have nuclear weapons secrets. Because this was the place where our nuclear bombers were based. This is where they kept the nuclear bombs. This was the Army Air Base in Roswell, New Mexico. It's where our nuclear weapons were basically based for the Strategic Air Command. Um, you should all see the movie Dr. Strangelove to get a sense of what that era was like. A truly great movie. The Strategic Air Command would carry these weapons and be ready. They'd be in the air all the time because we were always worried that our base would be bombed. And then we couldn't retaliate, so we had planes in the air at all times carrying nuclear weapons. 
where the president could send a signal to the plane, go bomb the Soviet Union. This is what the movie Dr. Strangelove was about. It was really a, a people look back on nostalgia with the 1950s. I can't believe it. I mean, here you are, when you have nuclear weapons in the airplane at all times, all set to bomb the Soviet Union if they get the secret signal from the president. And people look back on this era with nostalgia. This is the era when we would have take cover drills. And, and you ask kids, what do you worry about at night? And they'd say, oh, a surprise nuclear attack by Russia. This is the wonderful 1950s. Believe me, you're much better off today. OK. So Ewing was listening with these balloons these large balloons, that were, these were much larger than weather balloons. And they had, I have the images of these things, they're on the website. You can look at them, they, these huge balloons with long strings of microphones that would hang down. So you have this huge balloon, hundreds of feet in diameter, strings of microphones hung down. They had special reflectors on them so that people could locate, so that the people who were running this would be able to locate exactly where that balloon was. Because when the sound signal arrived, they had to be able to tell the direction it was coming from. And to do that, they had to know the position of this. So they had special radar reflectors on it. We'll talk more about those. So this thing would hang from the sky with these microphones and would send radio signals back down when the microphone picked up anything. And indeed, they picked up the first nuclear test of the Soviet Union. So this was a successful program until it was displaced by the seismic detection signal. One of these huge things crashed, 1947 outside of Roswell, New Mexico. And the people, the, the Air Force, put out a press release saying that our flying disc microphones had crashed. Actually, from the jargon of the day, they just called them flying discs, it turned out. It's sort of like calling a, a radio receiver a radio, or a microwave oven a microwave. Uh, they were calling these things the flying discs. And they announced that the other flying discs had been, had, that the, some flying discs had crashed when they had recovered them, was picked up by the newspapers as flying saucers. That's how they interpreted it. Now, the guy who announced that this classified program with the flying disc microphones had crashed got into big trouble, and they immediately retracted the press release and said, no, it was just a weather balloon. It was a lie. Interesting issue. Should the government ever lie to its own people? Back then, they made the considered decision that the right thing to do was to lie, because this program, I'm, you think back why it really required so much secrecy. Was there some way the Soviets could have hidden uh, this kind of a test if they knew about it? I think the worry was more that they would pick up on our tests. I'm, I'm not sure, but it was a highly classified program. Some information had leaked out, so they countered it with a lie. And this was done on purpose. Uh, the records have all been declassified, including long interviews with my friend Alpha Stan Spillhouse describing the program and so on. The remarkable thing about it is that although you know, I knew about the seismic detection of submarine of, 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 of nuclear weapons, I knew all about the atmosphere. But in 1995, I had never put them together to recognize that one could detect nuclear explosions through the sound channel in the atmosphere. I just never thought of that until this, it was actually a sen uh, several senators who insisted that the government publish this stuff and declassify it. Now there are all these huge documents describing this. When it came out, my reaction was, oh, am I dumb? Why didn't I think of that? Of course, the sound channel in the atmosphere. Some people, and maybe some of you, think right now, that what I'm doing, should have worn my black shirt so I could be the man in black. What I'm doing is giving you a wonderful cover story to try to convince you that we don't really have flying saucers that we captured in Roswell, New Mexico in 1947. And boy, didn't I come up with a great story to try to convince you it was actually a system to detect nuclear explosions. Ha, 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 did I fool you on that? Well, I don't think I could come up with such a great story because the sound channel in the oceans, the sound channel in the atmospheres, the fact that this really does work is, is such an amazing bit of physics. And of course it would work. As soon as I heard it, I knew it would work. And, uh, and so the fact that this, is, this was what it was designed for, it must be. Nobody could have come up with that great a cover story. But of course, Roswell, New Mexico now has a booming economy from people who go to see the site where the classified flying saucer story really happened. 
And there are all sorts of people who are really, I mean, you know, look at the movies, you look at the X-Files, all the stuff about Roswell, New Mexico. For those of you who haven't heard about Roswell, New Mexico, do a web search on Roswell uh, flying saucers, and you will be astonished by the 13 billion hits you'll get of people talking about what really happened in Roswell, New Mexico. Anyway, it's a fascinating story. It, 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 since 1995, the story has been written up in many magazines what really happened. I've just given you what really happened. Um, but, of course, I may be lying and just trying to cover what's uh, the story of the UFOs who are now collaborating with us and actually living here in parallel with us, these aliens. And I'm just not allowed to tell you that I am an alien or something like that. Anyway, that's the, that, that, that's the story of Roswell, New Mexico.